these seats up here. Um, if you feel like you need to see better, just come right on up. We might draw on the board a little bit. Um, don't feel like you have to stay way back there. I promise we won't bite. Also, just in way of, uh, if you weren't here, the last two uh, studies with us, um, <clears throat> we have a microphone. So uh, we want you, if you have a verse or a question, as we go through our study this morning, uh, feel free to raise your hand and, we'll, and I'll come right to you and so we can, they're, they're recording and so they want to get your, your thoughts, your questions, your verses uh, that you want to share on camera. That's the issue with that. I mean, recorded the audio on the camera. So let me know. Uh, we do like to have interaction with you. This isn't supposed to be me talking. I talked way too much last night <clears throat> and sometimes I do that, but feel free to interrupt me, raise your hand. In fact, do we have a, can I have a timekeeper? Sherry, would you let me know when it's, because I can't see that clock up there. So what time? Uh, what time are we done, Jonathan? Um, it's 10.30. Okay, so just start waving at me when we're getting close. <clears throat> Got it. <laughs> um, so, so anything from Genesis to Revelation, useful. Feel free to bring it up if it's, it's something to do with a question or a comment or, or, or helping us to see what it is we're looking for. Uh, we want to do, this is Sabbath school time, so this is supposed to be an interactive study, and I'd actually much prefer to break up in small groups, but we're not prepared quite for that. So we'll do it all together as one big group, is that all right? Um, let's have a prayer before we begin. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we, we talked about the first night, how the heavens have been shut up, and it's not raining. Not physical rain is the problem, but we seem to be floundering around in the dust trying to find food to eat, and we need the rain. But we, we also talked about how the problem is not your willingness. It's not you who are uh, refusing to, to, to help us. It is we who unknowingly often have been shutting up the heavens like iron that we not receive rain. And last night, Lord, we talked about uh, what it really means to come into full dependence on you and stop trusting in our wisdom and our knowledge and, and all the verses that we think we know, but really drinking in what you have to share with us. So we ask for that again this morning, that you will lead and guide my thoughts and everyone's thoughts in the room, that we might focus on you and really discern your love. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> this morning, our topic is going to be more focused on just looking at God. The last two nights, if you were here, we were focusing on our problem a little bit. <clears throat> I usually like to do that at the end of the seminar, but we thought we'd try it at the beginning, see what happens. So we did that. But this morning, for Sabbath school time especially, we're going we're gonna to work on what, what is God like? So I'm, I'm going to solicit help from you. I want you to help me put this together. I'm just going to put a few words on the board, and I want you to help me uh, come up with stories or verses uh, that helped to establish this. Now, some of you saw this last year, and that's great if you remember some stuff. If you were here last year and saw it, instead of little answers, I want you to help me with verses, right, if you've seen this before. If you haven't seen this before, then feel free to throw out any idea, any thought, any question that you want us to, to work on, uh, even if you don't have a proof text for it. That's okay. <clears throat> All right? God is awesome. God is awesome. That is true. And nobody else deserves that word. Nobody else, say that again, nobody else deserves... deserves the word awesome than God. <clears throat> well, when you think about God now this morning, I want you to especially think about the Father. We often um, think about Jesus, talk about Jesus, and that's, that's useful and valuable. We're going to push that a little bit further today. If you'll turn, this is where we're going to start. John chapter 14, and I'm going to bring the microphone. I'd like somebody to read for us verse 6 through 9. 6 through 9, John 14, 6 through 9. Who would like to read that? Okay. Following along in your version. Now, if your version has a particular interesting part to it, please let us know after we read it. We'd like to get uh, several, several views. What's that? Oh, yeah, it's kind of there. But... <laughs> Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Father, if you had known me, you would have known the Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, 
Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Now think, think right there for a moment of the context. Jesus has been teaching his disciples for how long at this point? Three years at least, right? Coming on three and a half now. And uh, this, is way, this is the night before the crucifixion that this discussion is happening. And they had the supper already. They had the washing of the feet. The disciples have still been distracted about who's first in the kingdom and who's in charge and all that. But they're out. They've left the room now, and they're out kind of in the, in the say, headed towards the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is still talking and teaching. And here's one of the things he says, right? Uh, I am the way and the truth and the life. And, and the disciples are, are now at this point listening in. Oh, he's saying something we're, we're not used to hearing him say. That's a new one, right? So they're focusing in. And, and then Philip's response, you see that there? Well, we'd love to see the Father because no one has ever seen the Father, not at any time, right? And so Philip just comes out with it, you know, uh, I'd like to see that. Could you show us that? And, and we'd, be, we'd be happy if we just got to see that. He's thinking like, like the story of Moses, right, who got to go up on the mountain, and in the mountain, in the cloud, in the fire, Moses got to behold the glory of God. You know that story. And so these are the, probably the stories that are in the minds of the disciples right at this moment. Wow, see the glory of the Father. Now, Philip, he wasn't one of the three that was up on the Mount of Transfiguration just a few weeks before. Peter, James, and John did get to see that. Not sure they understood what it was yet. But now Philip, he's just coming out with it. Show us the Father. And here's, here's the amazing part, Jesus' answer, right? I, I've been here for three and a half years, Philip. Don't, don't you understand? If, you see, if you're looking at me, if you've seen me, Jesus saying, you've seen the Father. Now, the reason why we're going to start there is as we have our discussion next, I want you to keep in mind that this amazing little fact that grows so large it can encompass our whole basis for gospel, is this little verse, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, if you have any questions about what God is like, where do you look? Jesus. Yeah. And not to any of us, uh, not, to the, not to theologians, right? But to Jesus, the only true representation of what the Father's really like. That, that's, that's the sort of the cornerstone. So as we discuss this, I want you to keep that in mind. But before I go on, anybody's version have something unique we should... We should, or go ahead. You got a thought or a question? I was going to give you another scripture. Okay, go ahead. First John 4, 8. Okay. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Okay, good. So helping us define again what God is like, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this thought about Jesus, here's what I want you to sort of open your mind to, is that anything that doesn't match Jesus, probably there's a problem with our thinking. Anything that doesn't fit... What we find in the life of Jesus, in the teachings of Jesus, and we have this theory or this idea about God, if it doesn't match Jesus, it's incorrect. And here's why that's so important. The devil has been spending 6,000 years now inventing false theories about God. Lots of them. In fact, uh, as we were driving over here from Washington, which is where I'm from in Colville right now, uh, we were, we were talking about the fact that, man, the devil has probably made up a twisticated understanding of every single verse in the Bible. Every one. You read one, he's got, a, he's got a theory for you. He's got some way to throw out an idea that's going to take you off in the wrong direction. Every single one of those verses, right? So it's very important that we say, okay, we might be confused about some things. Let's, let's bring it back to does it match Jesus. So I want you to help me real quick. Help me explain... Maybe to somebody that doesn't know God's love. How do you explain that? What, what story or illustration, either from the Bible or your own parable that you have thought of or made up, that would help us explain to somebody what God's love is like? How do you describe it? Unconditional. She's going to use the word right off the bat. <clears throat> unconditional. Unconditional. What do we mean by unconditional? What does unconditional love mean to you? Um, it doesn't matter what I'm like, the Lord still loves me. No matter what? No matter what, if I love him. Even if you're Judas? <laughs> if I love Jesus, he loves me. Well, what if you don't love Jesus? Uh, I think he probably loves everyone, but... Good. 
Unconditional love. But give me, give me some, a Bible verse or a story. Let's keep adding to this. I agree. He has unconditional love. We say that. We say it quick because it's simple and you know, concise. But we've got to fill that out because there's, there's, there's big bulletin board signs that say Jesus is love or God is love. And people drive by and be very angry about that idea. Their idea of what that is may not be so good. So how do we add to that? Jesus still loved the Israelites when they had idols, when they turned their backs on them. He always loved them no matter what. Loved them no matter what. That language is there. In the Old Testament, sometimes we're reading some pretty wild things where God's talking about his people when they're off track, right? When they're rebelling, when they're in idolatry. And God will talk about them in ways that sound like, wow, did he just say that about us? Like donkeys in heat? <laughs> you know, meaning chasing after other gods? Really? He's saying that about us? Idolatry, worship, and all that? But then you keep reading a little bit further, and what does he start saying? But I want you back. And I'm going to come, come and get you. We've got one thought over here. Go ahead. I suppose with God's, God is love, <clears throat> you know, the story of Simon, I have something to say to you. Okay. You know, if somebody has forgiven little, they love little. If you be forgiven much, they love much. And okay. So I think that, that that picture fits in my mind quite well. Good. That's Simon uh, at the feast, right? That's, that's the one who is responsible for helping to destroy uh, Mary's life before her conversion with Jesus, right? And, and, and that little story and that little parable and, and Simon answers it, right? He who has been forgiven much will love much as the woman is washing Jesus' feet, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a great one because Jesus is, is confirming to him that is how it works. Okay, go ahead. This is in Jeremiah 31, uh, starting in verse 33, it says, I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people, and they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their family, saying, you should know the Lord, for everyone from the least to the greatest will already know me, and I will forgive their wickedness and will never again remember their sins. It is the Lord who provides the sun to light the day and the moon and the stars to light the night. It is he who stirs the sea into roaring waves. His name is the Lord Almighty, and this is what he says. I am as likely to reject my people as I am to do away with the laws of nature. Who? Just as the heavens cannot be measured and the foundation of the earth cannot be explored, so I will not consider casting them away forever for their sins. I, the Lord, have spoken. Good. That's a good description from God speaking to his people. Did he cast off his people? Good, thank you. <laughs> really? Nobody? No, he did not. Did they cast him off? Yes. There's the problem. God is chasing us and pursuing us with unconditional love. Just so we can sort of shorten this up, how many, well, let me ask it another way. Does anybody disagree that God has unconditional love for you? Okay. And that's an important first piece, right? But now we're going to challenge our thoughts on that. We, we got a hand right here. I don't need that. Yeah, so they can get it on, on record there. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So there is a condition for his everlasting love. Because probation closes on earth. Yeah, don't you love that See, This is why I wanted to say that. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Because it is true, as, as I just said, right, Israel did cast him off. Mm -hmm. And so they said, we do not want that unconditional love. But did he cast them off? No. That's... That, that, it's kind of interesting how, how, how much we want to make sure that somebody knows you might not get in, right? That's, an important, we keep, that's kind of important to us. Go ahead. I'm going to disagree with what my uh -oh. lovely sister there just said. <laughs> if, if you love me, keep my commandments. That does not say that he's not going to love us. Right. That's if I love him. Well, the focus is on that's it. a demonstration that I love him. He doesn't stop loving me. Okay, now shake hands. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <clears throat> sorry. Friday night we were talking about how back in 1888 we, we got in all these arguments and the biggest problem was not so much about the details of the wording as it was our fighting with one another. So most important is that we love one another. Go ahead. Or, oh, yeah, I got to get the microphone to you. 
Well, one of the most astonishing things is <clears throat> that when you come to God and surrender yourself, all the bad things, all the sins that you've done in the past, he's going to throw them in the trash and not use them against you. To me, that's the most awesome part of love. Okay, good. And this unconditional love idea, which still is, you know, we keep saying that so quick and so easy, but it really challenges a lot of our thinking because we've been very trained in he loves you if. He lo the other night they did the song, uh, Jesus Loves Me, and then they were brave enough to do the verse, he loves me when I'm good, and then it comes, he loves me when I'm bad, though it makes him sad. And we learn that kind of stuff in crater roll, but then we become adults, you know, and we have to get the, the, the serious stuff. <laughs> And all of a sudden it starts getting very complicated because watch this, I want you to help me understand how forgiving is God. Now remember, we're not talking about us. All right, we love to talk about us and, 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 and our part in all this, but how forgiving is God? I'm hearing totally here to my left. To okay, did you guys get that? I think everybody could hear that one. Takes our sins, casts them to the bottom of the sea right here. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, too. So did he love us while we were yet sinners? Did he forgive us while we were yet sinners? Before we repented? See, see, here's, here's the question. What do we have to do to... Let me just tell you this story. I was uh, meeting with a fellow who called me up on the phone, and he was really distraught. I mean, he was really struggling. I could tell by the sound of his voice. And he was talking about how his brother just passed away, and it sounded like he was afraid he might die any day now himself. <clears throat> and he just sounded really not good. And so I, I said, can I come see you? So I went over to his house and his little apartment there, and I sat on the couch right in front of him. And I figured, you know, he sounds so distraught. Let's not waste any time chit-chatting. So I thought I'd get right to it. And I just asked him, what are you working on? And he held up a little theological book. And he said, well, I'm trying to figure out how do I get forgiven? What must I do to get forgiven? We, we often say, what must I do to be saved? But today we think of it in terms of what must I do to be forgiven, right? What is that one thing? That's how they come ask him, ask Jesus. What's that one thing I must do in order for God to love me, to forgive me, right? And we're very sort of focused on this getting into heaven subject, but this one comes before it. And if we have this wrong, it'll bar up the doors to heaven, actually. So this man that I was talking to, I said, uh, how long have you been a church member? Oh, mo most of my life. He's about 36 or 8 now. <clears throat> and I said, and, and uh, he, you know, again, his health is not well. And he's, he's depressed and he's struggling and he's having trouble with drinking and these kind of things. And so he's trying to figure out, what do I have to do? How am I ever going to get forgiven? And, and I asked him, how long have you been a church? Well, all my whole life so far. And I said, and what have you learned so far about forgiveness? What do you think he said to me? You have to repent. Theological good answer, sounds like, right? You have to repent. And then I asked him, well, what is the definition of repent? Now, I know you know this one. What did, what did he say? Ask forgiveness. Ask forgiveness? That's not quite what he said. That was a piece Turn of it. Turn away from sin. Stop sinning, Right? And, 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 and repent, prove, prove that you're done with all that sin in your life, and then you can be, is that how it works? Is that how it worked for the thief on the cross? Is that how it worked for this woman thrown at Jesus' feet, who is an adulteress? He's the one that speaks first. I love this story. A man comes down through the roof. They let him down because he big crowd, and they couldn't get through, and the guy couldn't walk. So they let him down through the roof. And, and he, as, as he's coming down, who spoke first, the man or Jesus? Jesus spoke first. What did he say? Your sins are? Is that present, past, future? What, what tense is that? I, I, we're kind of comfortable with past, but I'm going to suggest to you past, present, future. God didn't sit up on, on his throne in heaven and say, I, I really have trouble with those people down there. I need to really whip up on them until somebody at least comes in and, and earns some forgiveness for them. That is not the purpose of the cross. The cross was not Jesus talking God into being forgiven, be forgiving. 
Steps to Christ says, this great sacrifice, meaning Christ's death, was not made in order to create in the Father's heart a love for man. Not, not there to make him willing to save. Who did the sending? God did the sending. He's the one that sent the Son so that we could behold his goodness. And here's a verse for us. It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. repentance. The goodness of God leads to repentance. So as the goodness is displayed, uh, repentance might be awakened in the heart. And it doesn't for everybody. It didn't for Judas. Judas kept pushing it off and saying, I, I know he's loving and forgiving, but I don't want it. Peter, who also denied his Lord, like Judas, he saw that in Jesus, though, and said, I, I know my Savior. I know what he's like. I know how he'll treat me after I have done what I've done. Right? Peter hung on to that. Unconditional Love, unconditional forgiveness. You know that God knew what you were going to do before you were ever born? He knew every sin you'd create, commit before you were even here? It says he knows the hair on our head, right? He knew us in the womb. David talks about in that same Psalm 51 how I was birthed in iniquity. That doesn't mean his mother committed sin to have him. That means that he was born how? Sinful, like you and I. And our natural nature, our nature is to, to not be forgiving. Our nature is to say, well, I'll forgive you if. You know, if you at least be nice to me. If you at least apologize. If you at least come to me and give me a gift of some sort, right? We have many different variations of this thing. And it got so extreme in the Dark Ages that they had uh, indulgences, it was called. The whole concept of that is simply some gift that's brought to, to earn some time off of torture or, 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 or off of purgatory or off of, uh, you know, in trouble time and, and to get in. That's what it was. And, and the poor people, the peasants, the commoners, <clears throat> they would spend until there was past spending to try to get some peace with God. Struggled in their hearts. How will I, as my friend, this isn't 2,000 years ago or 1,800 years ago or even 400 years ago. This is my friend sitting in this couch across from me in his chair and saying, I, I, have, to, I have to do something to earn my forgiveness. So I looked at him and I said, I'm so sorry we've lied to you all this time. That is not how it works. God loves you and he forgives you before you ever realized you were doing something wrong. That's why he got off his throne, to come down here and say to us, I love you, I forgive you, I'm not holding it against you. In fact, you can test me on this, check it in Romans. You'll find that Paul talks about in the past, sins from the past, God did what with them? No, not the deepest part verse, not the, not wiped them away yet. There's another, there's another word in Romans, he overlooked. The actual word is he passed over them, like Passover. That's the actual wording used there. He overlooked them. He didn't hold it against us. You'll find David talking about, blessed is the man whose sins are not, here's a fancy word for you, you ready? Imputed, or in the King James, imputeth. Yeah. Imputed against him. That means held against him. Yes, we were enemies of God. When Christ came, that got proven. He came to his own, and his own not only knew him not, they didn't even like him, rejected him calling him a heretic, calling him demon-possessed, the devil himself. Put him on a cross, beat him, whip him, spit on him. That's how we responded to this love. That's our nature. That's what we're born with. And God said, but I loved you so much, I didn't hold it against you. I came to you that you might see. Remember, if you've seen me, you've seen. So we could behold that goodness, and our hearts might be cracked open like Peter who said, Lord, I see that you're very forgiving. If I forgive seven times, that's, is, that's pretty good, right? I mean, the, the Jewish concept was three or five. I read, I read both, so I'm not exactly sure which one it was, but it was less than seven. And Peter's overdoing that. He's going to say, well, I'm going to go for a bigger number. Lord, that's really the limit, don't you think? I mean, that's good enough. And Jesus' answer was, if you put a limit on forgiveness, you don't know or understand the Spirit of God. There is no limit to his forgiveness. There is no limit to his mercy, to his grace. There is a limit, however. That limit is how long will it take for us to reject him 
enough that we will never turn and submit. Submit to what, you say? And I repeat, I've been repeating this. I'm going to keep using this because it's sort of relative to us. Submit to stopping the gossip, to stopping the criticalness, the judgmentalness, which are the first steps and stages of murder. To stop the adultery, which is bowing down to any other thing that we depend on other than God. Oh, we make many gods, and we won't go into all that today, but you see what I'm, what I'm saying, right? Jesus was coming to say, I can rescue you from what you are, the sin inside you. So the man comes down through the roof, and Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. You remember the Pharisees? They're in the corner there. They're having real trouble with what Jesus just said. Why? Anybody know why? They didn't think it was right. Not just for him. It wasn't right to forgive sins in that way. Why? You have to go to the temple. You have to get a lamb. And you have to cut its throat. Then maybe God will forgive you. That's what they thought. That's what they taught. Can you imagine living under this concept that God needs dead animals? That'd be like you at home with your children. And, you know, when they're little, like five and six years old. And you say, look, you're old enough now to understand the rules here. So from now on, if you disobey, <coughs> something's going to have to die. So the children go out in the afternoon, they're playing in the backyard, and, and they know they just did something they shouldn't do, and they're, they're kind of sorry for it. So they get the, the cat or, or, or lamb. We have lambs at our house. And they kill it, and they bring it to you and say, Mom, Dad, we're sorry for what we did. What would you think of that? See, the, the sacrifices were not a sweet-smelling aroma to God. God didn't delight in sacrifice, Psalms 51 again. God didn't want dead animals. What did he want? For us to realize we were full of selfishness. We were full of evil striving. We were full of evil surmising. We were full of evil talking about one another. I mean, surely we should talk evil about King Saul, right? I mean, he's a wicked leader in our country. Huh? Did David do that? No, he did not. When he had a chance to kill him twice, did he do it? No. See, th this, is this, this is why David was a man after God's own heart. David understood that forgiveness also was unconditional. Forgiveness, unconditional. Amen. You're forgiven whether you want to be or not. That isn't the problem. God is not up there struggling to forgive. What is he up there working on? Getting us to become forgiving. Getting us to be willing to turn the other cheek at every turn. We don't like that, right? It's against our, someone asked me about Fourth of July yesterday, so it's in my mind, I've got to say it. Uh, it's it's kind of like our, our, our independent, we will not submit. I mean, we're the country that, that you know, uh, we fight for our independence, fight for our rights. Did Jesus do that? No. Jesus came and he showed us what it looked like to lay our lives down to serve others even if it means losing his life. And we have many other examples from the scripture about that. That's how forgiving God is. But he wants to get on to this next one. Healing. Sorry, I'm kind of going fast because I'm... Yep, yeah, we are going to run out of time. <clears throat> Healing. Healing is what we talked about last night, for those of you who are here. Healing is all about what God wants to do in us, for us, and to us. Is this conditional or unconditional? Unconditional? Some said unconditional. Some say conditional. Yes, because you've been to the seminar before. <laughs> think, think carefully now. Don't go to sleep on me. Think carefully. Is, it, is healing conditional or unconditional? Let me ask it this way. Did, did people in Jesus' time get healed physically? Yeah. Did everybody? No. Why did some not? They didn't ask. They wouldn't let him into the town. They refused to, to come to him. Right? They didn't believe is ultimately what it, what's at the bottom of it, right? Because they're looking at go, yeah, I know that other town is talking about they all got healed, but we just don't believe it. Or they were made an example. Or they were made an example of explain. Let me get the microphone so you can explain that. Go ahead. Or you have the case of John nine. Okay. Why did this man sin? No, he was sin so that the God's love could be showed. So you know, he they were made a demonstration of. Okay. Like, like some that got healed is what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Good. Uh, John 9 is one, the blind man you're referring to, right? Another one is the man by the pool of Bethesda, right? Jesus just walks in and says, you, would, would you like to be healed? Yeah. <laughs> so that's what the man said, sort of. 
well, I don't have anybody to get me to the pool. Anyway, we won't go into that story, but, but the point is not everybody was healed because not everybody were willing to come to Jesus. Many people wanted to have their religion. That's why Jesus said to them, you search the scriptures, you study them. You memorize them, you quote them, but they tell you to come to me to be healed, and you won't do it. That's, that's a paraphrase, of course. But that's what he was saying. He was saying that we're all into our knowledge and our ability to proof text and prove others wrong about their theories. But have we, the Advent people, have we come to God so we can be healed yet? Or are we too busy still doing what the Pharisees and Sadducees love to do? argue about points of scripture and theology. Satan loves to take <clears throat> a concept about God and split it into two pieces and then hand each piece to a different brother or sister and then have them argue over it. Because see, you're at least working on scripture and you're just convinced that, that your point is the only right point. But we must bring those points back to Jesus and say, where did Jesus teach about that? Where did Jesus show us what that looks like? And again and again, we're going to see God is working on something very simple. It is to transform us who are dead in trespasses and sin into his likeness. Into his likeness. So that we become more and more like Christ who was so loving and forgiving. Well, you think about it. They were beating on him, whipping him, spitting on him. And the devil was behind all that with every demon he had available to war against Jesus and get Jesus to just take the suggestion of, of giving up and becoming frustrated. Just for one moment, just one time, just misrepresent your father just once by being short, by being goofy, clowny, right? By, 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 by taking the things that are holy and making them what? Common. Just, just anything. Just do something that helps the people get confused about the truth about your father. That's what the war was. That was the war going on at the cross. Did Jesus for one minute or moment become unkind or unforgiving? Did he lose his temper? Did he talk in a rough way to people? I mean, I, I don't, you know, humanly that isn't possible. Humanly, you cannot do that and produce that. That takes divinity. And this is the divinity that God is offering. This is the healing that he's offering to you and to me. To put that inside so that we too can represent Jesus and his Father with God working through us. Okay, That's what we mean by healing. Any thought or question about the healing part? It's conditional. Why? It's only if you want it. It's only if you want it. He will not force you to have to be like him or force you to have to live with him. He wants how many to be saved? All. all. He wants to live in all hearts, but the heart must be willing to let him in. Comment? The, you know, it seems like healing is still just another attribute, but it seems as you're talking all the way through, it seems really what God wants is growth. Growth. Okay, you know, I would call it you know, maybe unconditional growth. It seems like his, his tendency is, how do I get people to grow from A to B? Good. You know, it starts out, you know, talking about John the Baptist. He grew in wisdom, then talks about Christ. He grew in wisdom and stature. You know, Mo, uh, Samuel kind of did the same thing. So it seems like God's program is really kind of focused on how do we get people to grow? Healing, you know, Hezekiah was probably not a good thing that he was healed. <laughs> I think that sometimes we pray for healing, and it may not be a good thing. But what God is always looking for is, well, how can I get growth? And, you know, you're talking about, you know, forgiving. You know, when my, my girls are two years old, threw a spoon on the floor or something like that, you know, I didn't really worry about it. It wasn't, it wasn't an issue of forgiveness. Um, you know, and guess what? They don't do it now. That's it kind good. of took care of itself. <laughs> Yeah, and the question there, just to push the forgiveness one again, what if they do come home at 35 and do it? Do we still love them? Do we still forgive them? Can we necessarily fix the relationship if they're unwilling to have it fixed, unwilling to open their hearts to us? No, right? So again, healing, and, and I, I'm glad you did that because it's got to be more words than that. 
In fact, we usually like to put up a bunch of words. Redeemed, restored, cleansed, uh, some like fancy words like sanctified and things like that. But you're right. What we're talking about is the process through which God will transform our hearts. You see it in every story. It's not an instantaneous thing. Some of them look fairly fast. Like if we just look at the story of Peter from the night he denied Christ to the next, well, let's say 50 days later, right? Pentecost, opening speaker. That looks pretty fast. But we got to include the fact that God was working with him long before. In fact, God was working on Peter from the moment Peter was born. Before Christ came and said, come follow me, or Peter never would have, right? So it is. It is this process of transforming us. So we, we really should use lots of uh, adjectives or words. I've got to go clear to the back here real quick. Pastor's got some thoughts for us. I was looking at the, it, you know, you went through and talked about, you know, the unconditional love from the perspective of God to us. Mm -hmm. You've looked at forgiveness as an unconditional from God to us. Mm -hmm. But on the healing, we swept, swapped it, and we're looking at the conditionality of man. If we look at it from the perspective of God, he promises healing. Good. So it's unconditional healing. However, he says, he promises that he will heal. In fact, it said, in Jeremiah, it says, if you call on me, I will heal. The question that we have to look at is, even now, is that we may ask for healing. He may not grant it now, Physically, but he will about. heal us. That is a, so that the, the healing is unconditional in from the sense God's that side. from God's side, Good. just like forgiveness is unconditional from God's side. Good. But from our perspective, he may not do that because we have not asked or because we have rejected him. But he also at times, like for Paul, Paul prayed that his thorn in the side, whatever it was, would be removed. God said no. Ellen White had a problem, and she prayed that it be removed, and God said no. She asked three times. God said no, because it was for her, as is mentioned, for her growth or for her purpose of keeping her in a condition that would be workable. I'm assuming Paul was probably the same way, probably kept him humble. Okay. Okay, so there, but, but God will ultimately, he will heal. So it is, I see it as an unconditional from God's perspective. Good, thank you. Good thoughts, because again, we're trying to clarify how do we view God? How do we understand him? And, and it is true that we can say, hey, he, can, he, can he love Judas? Can he love Satan? No? no? Yes. Satan got too far? Too... See, it gets complicated. God is love. Why do we keep accepting ideas that change that? that? That say to us that, well, he's love up to a point, and then he stops loving. Really? That's like the sun going out. You know, the scientists, they've got to figure out how long the sun's going to last, right? Because it's going to run, you calculate the mass and whatever, you can figure out how, how much fuel is left. They don't know what they're talking about. The sun does not run out. Why? Because God keeps it burning, right? I mean, if he needs to turn it off for our benefit, he can do that. But it has nothing to do with how much fuel is up there. See, that's man's way of thinking. God is love, and it does not stop, and it does not change. Thanks for the challenge on the healing, because again, God wants to heal mostly what? Our heart. That's the greatest miracle. That's the thing he's working on always in Judas's life, in Peter's life, in, in the, the ten uh, lepers who came to him. He healed physically, because our minds with that word often, right? and, the, and I do that on purpose, we're connecting to the idea of physical healing. He did the physical healings to draw our faith up to that he could do the spiritual healing. That's its purpose. That's what it's for. And, and if he says no, like in the examples you use there, it's because God knows for that person's spiritual healing, that needs to be withheld. And for another one, it's the very thing that they need. Okay, so that's okay. But m mostly we're talking about healing of the heart. Can you pass the mic right back there to Charlie? I want to I want to go back to his point. Okay. And you and you just covered it, and that is, man, us, view healing primarily physically. And and the great the great question always is, Father, I've prayed to you, why have you not healed me of cancer? Why have you not healed me of this ailment? Where the healing is, what have I healed you in your heart? Right. Where is the real healing? Where's the real healing for the parent that goes through a really difficult time with the child? 
or loses a child? Do I get angry or do I look to God to learn, understand, and transform? That's right. Man's condition is physical. God's condition generally is spiritual. And we think in terms of Correct. physical, right, all the time. So, so part of what's going on there is that for us to grasp, you know, these bodies, uh, no problem for God to fix. No problem to have a whole new glorified body once he comes. These are temporary tents. Did you know that the patriarchs, they lived in tents? Yeah. How many here live in tents? I think we're following the wrong program. <laughs> they lived in tents. Why? <laughs> yeah, that's how we got where we are. That's because what everybody did. They dwelt, they dwelt in tents because they, okay, thank you. They dwelt in tents because this world was not their home. This body is not my home. God is working on healing the heart. That's most important. He can transform this at any given time that he chooses, right? Twinkling of an, Twinkling of an eye and all that stuff. But mainly we want to get understood this healing thing. Now, we didn't get to the wrath. So we may have to postpone that to late this afternoon. But I just want to tell you, when we look at God's wrath, we've got to ask the same questions. Is our idea of God getting angry suddenly in conflict with this? Does it make all this go away? Do we see him as a, a frustrated, angry, vengeful God? When I say it that way, you, of course, say no. But if I ask it in a few other ways, you're suddenly going to start going, well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> so we do need to, to, in your own studies, to go further with this. We need to behold God as the one who desires us, who desires to come into our hearts and into our lives. He's asking that we learn to submit and depend on him, right? That's what we were working on last night. That's the main point of this healing part. And as we, as we go further to ask the question, how did Jesus show us what God looks like when he gets angry? It, it, it sort of concludes this point of it proves yet again that he's more loving than we thought, more gracious than we thought, more kind than we thought, and desires most of all to rescue you and me. Not in our condition, but from our condition of sin. Right? Let's have a prayer, and then we better break, and we'll come back in a little bit. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love, and we thank you for the chance to discuss these things and to, to bounce around these ideas, but we ask mostly that you will inspire us in our own personal studies, that we might find these things, that we might understand, and that we might have clarity so we can trust you like we never have before. And that we can submit to you and depend on you and that you'll work that work to write your character, your law in our hearts. That we might be your representatives on the earth. Not, not mixed up with uh, wrong expressions about you in our facial expressions, our emotions, but actually have the mind and the heart of Christ in us. We thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.